great piano players in the jazz world, Mr. Mark Levine. He's been living in uh, Los Angeles. I know him from his books. He has, he has many books out, including the Jazz Theory book, uh, the Jazz Piano book. He has a new book now, uh, I think, on the, on the order of uh, how to voice uh, standards at the piano. Um, he's, he's a Grammy-nominated uh, musician. Uh, um, I'm sure, not sure which record it was. It was the nomination, but I know you've been doing a lot, a lot of Latin uh, uh, CDs lately. He's played with uh, Joe Henderson, uh, Woody Shaw, Mongo Santa Maria. So how about a hand for Mark Levine? Mark Levine. Just about my favorite city, especially for the food, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me get acquainted with you. How many people here play piano? Raise your hand. One, two. Well, no, you don't One, two. Anybody else? Okay. One, two, three. Okay. Any brass players? Any reed players? Two. Uh, bass players? Drummers? Two. Excellent. Uh, guitar? Good, we got a big mix. Um, so I can talk about anything. Where do I start? Uh, you know, probably today is going to be open. I'm just, I'm just going to open it up to questions. Uh, so far away. Who's got a question? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> uh, don't be shy. What's the if you were gonna, if you were going to ask a question, what would be the first question you would ask the gentleman on the left? How do you organize all the thoughts in your jazz theory book to have a comprehensive order or like a sequence in which you can understand all the concepts? Do you have a copy? No, not on me. It's on my computer. Uh, have you read, have you studied any theory before? Uh, not prior to your book. Hmm. Uh, that's good. <laughs> uh, a lot of people start out with classical theory which uses a lot of the same terminology, but we use the same terminology in a different way. So it really doesn't help you that much, unless you study just basic theory, you know, um, major chords, minor chords, things like that. How about you? Are you a drummer or a guitar player? Guitar. Guitar. Ask a question. I don't have one yet. Okay. How about the drummer? Uh, yeah, can I get, can I get back to the <laughs> Can I, can I have a second to uh, Sure. How about you? Um, uh, what's your musical background? <laughs> your what? Uh, your musical background, you know, like I got started, uh, who taught you, your inspirations. Mm -hmm. Any questions? That's what he's saying. Yeah, I guess he's asking, where did you start? Oh, you where know, did I start? Where did you start? Yeah. Um, actually, I started when I was five years old. Oh, my God. Uh, don't ask me how many years I've been playing. I started when I was five. What if I practiced? <laughs> uh, and then I studied classical. I was not, not a prodigy at all until I was about 12, and then I discovered jazz. Uh, my brother gave me a Shorty Rogers record. He was my favorite musician for about a year. Then I heard uh, Benny Goodman, and he became my favorite musician. Then I heard Charlie Parker, and I hated it. <laughs> then I went on to Stan Kent, and around about that time, I started listening to the bebop. So that's been my, my uh, the ocean I swim in since then. Uh, right up to the present. Um, I was lucky to have some very, very good teachers. Uh, so I think I say, I say in the introduction of my books, none of this theory is mine. Uh, I just got it from my teachers. I had a great teacher in high school, and then I moved to Boston, went to school there, didn't learn anything at Boston University, zero. But I hung out at Berkeley School of Music. <coughs> That's where I got my education. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a great teacher there at the time. He's passed on since. In her Palmer, mm -hmm. he gave me uh, much of what I know today. Then, when I moved to the West Coast, I studied for a little bit with Barry Harris, uh, another great teacher. Uh, so I've just been lucky along the way. Uh, do you have a question? Yeah, um, I have one. Uh, I don't really play a lot of piano since I'm primarily a drummer, but um, I do sit down at the piano and my roommate's a bass player, my best friend's a bass player, and his like idea of chord progressions and his where things go, I'm like always intrigued and I really like that. And I, you know, wish I could obtain that, but when I sit down, I usually do 
like just shells on the left hand, yeah. like one and seven, or yeah. like octaves or something. But a vowel. Right. Is yeah. there a way to kind of open yourself to break yes. away from um, that other than like rootless voices? Definitely. There's a method that was taught to me in New York by a great arranger named Paul Overton. I don't know what that name is. He arranged the charts that his big band played it. Uh, you know, down the line. He showed me how to play tunes from just using three notes. If you were in a nightclub listening to me, you wouldn't go to the floor and say, you know, because it sounds full. Like, is there a way to kind of navigate um, things or to sure. come up with things? There's um, a whole series of voicings. Fortunately, they're arranged in groups because of similarity. Fourth voicings, which are normally associated with Macaulay Tyner, for instance. <coughs> Seventh, but you know, we don't play the major seventh that much. Left 
10, 4, 6. Full on the piano. 
arranging, you've got um, four saxophone players uh, playing a melody, a simple melody. <laughs> Reverse it. One. I can talk forever. 
it on Bobby, but I'm not going to. Um, in jazz, uh, I have certain recommendations that I give pianists. Uh, don't comp like this. <laughs> Sit down. I can't do this. <laughs> you 
big music, but just concentrate on the bass part, the nearest musician to you. Listen to them, assuming you know the music. Uh, just listen to them. Uh -huh. You'll hear things you should never hear before. And it won't influence your playing. I think that's the best answer I can give. Have you worked with guitar players in the past, and what are your thoughts on guitar and piano comping or yeah. trying to comp together? Guitar and piano don't really mix that well. Uh, part of the problem is in school bands, like middle school or high school bands, uh, the mothers and fathers of the, the instrumentalists expect everybody to be playing all the time. Mm -hmm. So they don't want to see the guitar players just sitting up there for a the whole course, or the piano player not playing for a whole course. But that's what happens in real life. Um, when I'm playing, a, if I go to a jam session, for instance, there's a guitar player in the rhythm section. We alternate. I comp for the trumpet player, he comps for the saxophone player. Uh, and the, the musician that's not comping can still comp a little, it's just really simple three note or four note voices. Uh, stay away from ninths or thirteenths because the piano player may flat those. So you don't get each other's way. Uh, now, piano players and bass players can work with each other all the time. Like uh, Oscar Peterson and the various guitar players that he has played with, they play together so much that they got used to each other. And I don't know, maybe Oscar told the guitar player, you know, lay out or do this or do that. Or don't uh, don't play any flat lines or sharp lines because I may do the opposite. I may play a natural line. Uh, so those are special situations with Kelly and uh, Wes McCombie. They played together so much that they were able to pull it off. But generally speaking, guitar players and piano players will alternate on the band stand. Now, when the piano player takes a solo, generally the guitar player either comes very lightly or not at all. When the guitar player takes a solo, if they're playing a single line, like a horn player, then the piano player can come just normally. But as soon as they go into uh, chordal voicing solo, I lay out because I don't want to get in their way. Yes? Can you talk a little bit about uh, how piano players comp uh, like the pre bebop piano players, you know, like Patty Wilson or Jess Stacy? That's a music that came a little bit before my time. So I'm really unequipped to answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, but I was about, I was about to say, what, to, to, to dovetail what you were saying about the guitar players, but I know Joe Pass, for instance. He talked about when he played with Oscar Peterson, he would use a lot of guide tone voices. Yeah. You stay out of the way of the upper, the, the, the upper structures. Thirds so, and sevenths. Right, right. But you know, thirds and sevenths, we kind of make a mantra of that. Uh, dominant chords always have to have a third and seventh. That's not true in all types of chords. Mm -hmm. uh, just education started out with major scale. Everybody assumed that everything is based on the major scale, which just isn't true. We've gone beyond that. So many chords are not from the major scale. They're alter chords, flat nine chords, half diminished chords. They're from melodic minor harmony, which doesn't even come from, from Western Europe, it comes from Eastern Europe. Uh, the diminished and the whole tone scales are artificial scales. They were un nobody played them at all until the 20th century. Or they were, there's anecdotal evidence that 19th century composers knew about them. It's actually a letter from me. It's, uh, Brahms and Chopin and Chopin and Brahms saying, what do you think of this British scale? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sounds like Michael Brown. <laughs> <laughs> so nowadays we think of like 75 scales, major, melodic, minor, diminished, alto, which is hardly ever used, and the blues scale, which is almost undefinable. So don't ask me any questions about the blues scale. I'll tell you what, don't turn the blues scale, but that's it. <laughs> So much more research. Yeah. Like I, I have a student, that maybe, maybe you are familiar with this, but I'm not, but the, the student asked me about the, the, the leading chromatic concept, you know, George Russell. Because that was when I was going to school at Berkeley, that was kind of the buzz, you know, Miles is under like leading chromatic concept, and all it is, it's, it, do, you, do you have any thoughts on that? Because to me, it's just, it's just yes, a I concept do. based upon Yes, I do, because when I was going to Bird practice out of that book, and then <laughs> after that, culture and practice out of that book. <laughs> There's certain books that come and go. Mm -hmm. uh, the Lydian concept, George Russell, bless his heart, uh, is one of them. But I never saw the worth of it. Yeah. I'm actually playing yeah. a Turkish jazz musician now. That's, that's his be all in it. Yeah. Well, I can't point to any. Can you point to any musician and say he's using the Lydian chromatic concept? It's just, to me, it's not. No. Because I mean, it's, it's something that's already.
already there. But that book, uh, did, you, did you get a chance to have a look at that book? It's very cerebral. Yes, it's very yeah. cerebral, and I disagree with the very first sentence of the book. <laughs> which is the most important scales in jazz, the most important scales in jazz are, first one, the Lydian scale. Yeah. Wait a minute, what about the blues scale? Uh -huh. <laughs> so I, I stopped reading after that. <laughs> <laughs> this had no fixation on the Lydian scale. Um, part of this fixation on the Lydian scale comes from the study of Iranian music, Chinese music, there's something in those, I've studied them a little bit and just forgot what they were. Uh, something about the raised fourth is the sign of God. And the Trinity, <laughs> all the stones. Uh, but I never, f I never, f I mean, it's okay when you've got a major seven plus four chord. That is a problem. Uh, if you want to avoid you, avoid you on the major scale, then you play the Lydian scale. But George Russell, like I said, bless his heart. I never met a single musician that I can point to and say, he studied George Russell. Mm -hmm. Another book that comes under the same heading is um, Slonemsky's The Sars of Scales and Chords. When I first yeah, was on the scene, Bird studied out of this book. And then Coltrane studied out of this book. Uh, everybody who studied out of that book, and I put the book down after three or four days and said, I want to read There's exactly one thing from that book but I've heard a jazz musician play. And it was played by Lee Morgan, and he probably figured it out himself and got it somebody else. It was on the C7 chord, he played. <laughs> Tends to make the female singer 
sang out of tune. I say female singer because generally they sang an octave higher than male singers. Male singers, the overtones are such that it doesn't clash. Female singers, it does. It makes them sound out of tune. Because the human voice, as far as I know, doesn't have overtones. So. I guess I could get in the way too if the vocalist is taking some liberties and bending notes or creating emotional nuances in the note on a fire chart. On a melody <coughs> note, the piano player accomplished playing that note. That's true. That yeah. might keep them from getting out or for making the sound go off. Or more way. Don't look at don't look at this side. <laughs> I'm looking at your book, it says Alban Berg, Violin Concerto, so it's probably going to be a heavy question. <laughs> Ask some about the 12 tones of scale. <laughs> that's really beautiful. Yeah. Um, I don't have a question. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. Thank you. How about you, the gentleman next to Well, One of the me uh, musicians uh, that you mentioned introducing yourself was Mango Santa Maria. Yes. And I think uh, many years ago, that's I'm reaching here, maybe 20 years ago, I was reading a biography of Coltrane called Chasing the Train. I think he's mentioned somewhere in this. At the moment, <clears throat> I have a job washing dishes where I can listen to music for five, six hours. And a worker is getting loads of, some albums I've heard before of um, uh, you know, various people. Um, uh, but an album, I think it's, it's called Afro Blue of Mongo Santamira, I'd never heard before, and it just blown me away. Um, and this, along with you know those Smiles albums you were listening to, I love them. I don't play this stuff, but I, I really love it, or Monk, and the whole bit. Um, but this here, I've never heard before. And of course, I recognize Afro Blue from Coltrane covering it, but listening to this album over and over, I feel like I'm hearing other things that might have influenced Coltrane's music, and I was wondering if that's possible or if if that association didn't occur. Like in the baseline on one, there's an extended piece that's like 12 minutes long. I'm going, wow, that sounds sort of like a love supreme, the bass line and the rhythm. A lot of the rhythmic ideas, I can see how maybe Elvin Jones might have heard, but did they hear that music at all? Or not really? Yeah, did Coltrane listen to that? Yeah, music? or this particular musician. You know, I don't think there's anybody left around that, from that era that's still alive that you can ask. Then you can ask, yeah. Maybe Jimmy Cobb or Sonny Rollins survived. Yeah, because I went, I went online and read about them. I was surprised to hear, because a lot of the music to me sounded almost like field recordings. It was so raw. Mm -hmm. Like some of it was more arranged with flute and whatnot, but some of it just sounded more like traditional song. But I read that he was in New York City when by the time he was recording, I was really surprised. Generally speaking, jazz musicians are not very much interested in Latin. That's changed so much in the last few years. Uh, and Latin musicians have been aware of jazz, I think, a little bit more. But when I think of Coltrane and Mungo Santa Maria, the first thing I think of is Coltrane generally gets credited with writing the song Afro Blue, mm -hmm. which is a mistake because Mungo Santa Maria wrote Afro Blue. Mm -hmm. And Coltrane took pains to announce the song was not written by myself, Mungo Santa Maria. So maybe he was familiar with Mungo's music. A little bit, maybe. He's probably familiar with all kinds of stuff. But uh, you know, that brings up the whole subject of Latin jazz. Um, how many of you here have listened to much Latin jazz? I'm not including Brazilian music. Let's say Cuban mm -hmm. jazz. A few hands are going up. Mm -hmm. I played with the Machitos, man. You played with Machitos, yeah. man? What do you play? Trumpet. Fantastic. Yeah. Machitos sometimes known as the father of, of Latin jazz. Yeah, they taught Bird and, and Dizzy. Yeah. 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 And I have those records. They had great records. But that was. Those were largely a jazz musician superimposed over a largely Latin orchestra. And there were a couple of jazz musicians in Machito's band. But it was still kind of a hybrid. Uh, and most of the jazz bands up until the late 70s were like that. I played with Molly for uh, almost two years. And uh, Did you know Ray Malinato? You know Ray was there? Yeah. You know him? I do. Yeah. He's no longer around. But I know. He was in the band actually, I think we overlapped by a week, or something like that. He was in the band actually before me. Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but generally, actually, in my experience at the time with Momo, it was three jazz musicians, four Latin musicians. All the jazz musicians had a little bit of feeling so they could play Latin. 
with Latin rhythm sections. And the Latin cats knew Latin music, didn't know much about jazz, but they were comfortable playing along with jazz musicians. So it never quite walked. For the time it did, those records were a lot of fun to listen to. Willie Bobo, uh, Pujo and all that, Soul Brothers, all these great early Latin jazz bands. But in the late 70s, uh, a bunch of musicians grew up together, playing together in New York, that were familiar with both genres, jazz and Cuban music, as well as pop and rock and Latin and well, other things wrapped around. around in the late 70s. Jerry Garcia. I mean, uh, the drummer player, so Jerry and his brother, Andy Andy's 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 Oh, the Gonzales? Yeah. Uh, Andy Gonzales. Oh, yeah. Andy Gonzales. Well, actually, those are the two people I'm about to talk about. Yeah. Uh, they grew up listening to all different genres, so to, have, to them there was no problem about playing the music. They could play a jazz tune and put it in clave, because they knew immediately which clave, 3-2 or 2-3, that it fit in. They didn't have to think about it. Me, I came along later. I had to learn about clave, learn what to listen for, to how to apportion a particular song or a, petition, a portion of a particular song to 3 2 or 2 3. Uh, but this bunch of musicians came along in New York roughly around the same time, late 70s. Don Elias, a great percussionist. And, uh, Martin Porcelli was a very, very good friend. Yeah. He, was, he was raised in that atmosphere also. So to them it was no problem. To me that was the beginning of Latin, true Latin jazz. Uh, because it was just, it just flew out of, it just um, flew smooth, flew, yeah, flew smoothly out of the musicians. They didn't have to think about fitting this type of music to that type of music. Um, questions? Yes? I was wondering if you ever played like Rhodes or Electric Keyboard? You know, I had Rhodes, which to me was the best keyboard ever made. Uh, and then I got tired, my back got tired <laughs> shoving it around. I did not like the stage model at all. Because the What's Vibrato the was just a big attraction of Rose at the time. It was achieved by phasing between the speakers. That went out the window. It's like funny. Like Leslie or something? You mean like something? Not by like anything spinning a moving part? It was just well, a phase. It was a moving part. It was this happening. It's a stereo effect. It's a stereo effect. That's right. how the reverb thing was achieved for the history. Now it's achieved electronically. It doesn't sound the way it doesn't sound the same. It just doesn't sound natural. So what ruined that was around 1972, I think it was, roughly. Um, this goes into economics. Uh, a lot of big companies decided to diversify and become conglomerates. Yeah. And so an electronic company would buy a company. Uh, CBS decided to buy Steinway. And then CBS decided to buy the New York Yankees. And then CBS <laughs> decided to buy Fender Rose. <laughs> it's a year. Fender Rose had lost its soul. Um, Steinway started a down, long downhill slide. And the New York Yankees went straight to last place. They stayed for several years. <laughs> <coughs> and then finally the Steinway employees bought the company back and started bringing the quality back up again. Fender Rose never recovered. Um, and the Yankees, of course, you know, they're stuck with, what, 18 more years of Alex Rodriguez. <laughs> um, so that was partially the reason why Fender Rose went out. And because the instrument was so darn heavy, I mean, when you're young, you can shut that around. But it's almost as bad as having, being an organ player. Uh, so I actually just gave up on it. And then I got a lighter keyboard, and then I just about a year or two ago I said, nah, forget it. So I haven't played it since. Unless somebody sets theirs up to have a key for me. And they tell me how, how do I turn it on, how do I get this sound. Uh, but I'm generally I'm not a fan of, of uh, keyboards. Older records with uh, true Fender Rhodes on it, Herbie, Chick, yes. Uh, next question, yes. Well, I, you were talking about Latin music and how since it wasn't, maybe you weren't born with it, you, you had to approach it differently, where you had to like, maybe in a more cerebral way, listen to it and pick out two, three, three. I don't know if that's cerebral, but like. I actually had good teachers. 
I was recruited into playing with a, a Latin band that played some Latin jazz. And the saxophone player was pretty well known at the time, Ricardo Mesa, Dick Mesa, knew how to teach, knew how to teach me. Then that percussionist I mentioned earlier, Donald Elias, was in the band also. So I had a month to learn the music. They sent me down with a bunch of 81 year records. And I learned how to play Latin music. Uh, not the complete version, but when I moved to Los Angeles, I was lucky to play with an old Cuban basement at Humberto Cane. Old Cuban musicians all remember Cane. Uh, and he taught me, he would say, You're playing the wrong clave. So I learned about clave from him. So it wasn't really cerebral as much as it was just experiential. Yeah. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Bud Powell's own Poco Loco? Mm -hmm. Pretty uh, uh, popular recording. If, as you know, on the recording I did, I think, three takes. The first take's okay, the second take's okay, the third take really takes off. That's because Max figured out that the tune is really in. Ding, 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 ding. It's in three, two, and it's like ding, 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 ding. Doesn't fit. So I don't know whether he knew about Latin music or clave at the time, but he probably knew the difference between three, two, and two, three. So here's an early example of Latin jazz. One musician from one genre slotting into the other genre and figuring out what to play. So I guess what I was really wondering about was. Did you eventually get to a point where it was more intuitive and you didn't have to think about it as much? Like you absorbed it and yeah. like... It's largely intuitive now. Yeah. Um, I got into the habit of automatically beating clave on any record that came up, especially in my car. I listened to most of the records in the car. Uh, and it was a pop record rap record, any kind of record. I would just automatically keep cut. No, that doesn't sound right. Must be two three. Yeah, it's two three. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it became intuitive by that kind of practice. I wasn't realizing I was practicing. I just wanted to play along with the record rhythmically. Uh, that's a good idea for you to practice yourself. Especially with jazz too. Not the seven four. Because it doesn't work in seven four. <laughs> but uh, it's four four or or either three four which you can feel in six eight. And you can attach a copy to it. Questions? Yes. Do you have any tips for creating more um, like chord movement when you're comping instead of just like seeing D minor seven playing that and then playing the next chord one voicing? Do you use that like bebop scale you're talking about a lot, or do you have any other? Methods? Bebop scales are usually mostly in your solos. Um, the one was a David Baker who wrote a whole bunch of books on the bebop scales. They figured out. If you play a C major scale, it's on an and, not on a strong B. But if you put the passing note as passing note in, ends up on one on a strong B. So he said, by the way, who invented the bebop dominant scale? I should digress here. Anybody have any ideas? Who? I said Bird. Charlie Parker? No, you're off by about 60 years. <laughs> it's roughly 1880 to 1920 an American composer lived. He's still playing, he's still playing, his music is still playing all the time today. That's a big hit. Especially on Friday nights. What happens on Friday nights? Football. <laughs> Here it is right there. <laughs> Uh, you may laugh at this, but wait a second. This is where jazz was born, right? New Orleans. Most of the early bands were brass bands, right? They didn't always play O.D. Oh, rap. They played a lot of marches. That was right when Sousa was at his height. And I'm sure you've seen posters from that era, uh, living right here in New Orleans. You must have showing the program for, you know, some of party at a park or something like that. And it was a, a, a jazz, J-A-S-S band playing at the party. <laughs> also, a Cuban band, or a Mexican band, because there was a lot of uh, communication between all three countries at the time, musical uh, communication. And 
on the on the program for the, the jazz band was always one or two Susan marches. So the trumpet player went home that night. He had a gig, you know. It's not such a <coughs> as you think. By the way, that thing about the program, the Cuban band and the Mexican band, the three chief ports in the Caribbean at that time, or the Gulf of Mexico, I should say, were Havana, New Orleans, and Veracruz. A lot of transactions went back and forth between those three ports, including bands traveling around the Gulf. You should probably know this because you live here. So, the early, early jazz had a tremendous Cuban and Mexican influence. Uh, it was a Jerry, Jerry Roll Morton once said, if it ain't got, what was this? Spanish tinge? Has to be. Jazz is not jazz unless it has a Spanish tinge. That's what he was referring to. So, and that has lasted through the music. It's la lasted large, largely underground in jazz. It comes up in some older compositions, especially by Latin musicians playing jazz, like uh, uh, the Valtor Voltaire played the Duke Ellington, I'm sure. What's his name? Rome Caravan. They sing out on his name. Juan Tizo? Don't you remember his name? Juan Tizo? Juan Tizo, yes. Somebody had. Play this song all the way through. You see that it fits right in Claude. But he was Cuban, I think, or maybe Puerto Rican. Anyway. Um, so it was largely underground, but it's but it was very popular. It's it was very prominent in black music, in what was used to be called race music. If you listen to old race records in the 30s and early 40s, almost all the music was right in Claude. So it, it existed in at least in the black music community all that time and it took until roughly the late 1970s for it to percolate and cross genders and create what Latin jazz is today. Stephen, there's a question. You know, when, you, when you see something or a composition that says and it's labeled Latin, to, to you does that mean Afro-Cuban or does that mean Brazilian? Or? It means that the ranger didn't know what he was doing. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's, that's one of the things we talk about in class too is, is that, you know, what does Latin mean? You know, you need to be more specific. Is it is a cha cha cha, or is it merengue, or is it is it Brazilian? Is well, it, is it samba? Is it songo? You can say things like that, like cha cha or mambo, because yeah. that gives the rhythm section at least an idea of what to play. Because what the drummer plays on a mambo is very different than what he or she plays on a cha cha, and it, it governs what the piano player plays also, and largely with the bass player. Uh, so it's mostly for the rhythm section, but. What it should say, it should give the genre like Cha Cha or Mambo, let's say 3 2 or 2 3. The Latin by itself to me just means Brazilian. I'm not putting down Brazilian music, I'm just saying it just means Brazilian. Because uh, Brazilian music, although it does have a clave, the clave is not accentuated in Brazilian music as much. It's almost a religion in Cuba, which clave, or at least it was until roughly 15 years ago. Now Cuban music sounds pretty much interchangeable with all the music in the world. But before then, uh, older Cuban music, classic Cuban music, had to be either 3 2 or 2 3. Um, there's a question over there. Oh, yeah, when you mentioned race records, I listened to a lot and I was curious about that because I don't hear a clave rhythm. But do you mean people like Charlie Patton and Blind Blake and Blind Lemon Jefferson that you can hear a clave in that? When you say race, race records, what are you referring to? I guess you know what I mean. Music from the uh, pop, black popular music in the 1930s. Yes, yeah, so I listened to a lot of that. Give a lot of the up there. I just did one. like Blind Lemon Jefferson, Memphis Minnie, Lonnie those, Johnson. Those are basically blues. Okay. Uh, blues basically has no clave. It can be played in. Yeah, that's why I was confused because that's what I would think of as race record. No, I'm thinking of. Give me some names. Well, I think of the early uh, New Orleans music, I mean, the, the street beat. Tech, 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 oh, okay, tech, I know what you're saying. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, mean, it's all, it's I was trying to think in my mind how you were hearing that. I know, I but can. now I understand what you're talking about. The first time I ever heard yeah, it, yeah. Bobby was... I, the song, I Go, I Go, on. Yeah. Bobby in the bass. Uh, yeah, I enjoyed it. The bass drum. 
first example of love I heard was shame and anger. So, yes. Is it true that in a given tempo of a song, if it's uh, say a two three clave, <laughs> you can play the opposite clave against it? If you play it twice as flat fast, I have to stop. Yes, if, if, a tone, if a tune goes into double time, generally the clave reverses. Reverse. I've not heard enough Cuban bands not do that. Uh, it's not really a rule, but it generally happens. Uh, here's a Cuban note. If you play the wrong clave, da 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 uh, my favorite Cuban band of all time is Jack Delgado. Many of you famous big band. He, he absconded from Cuba about 10 years, 10 years ago, so he's in this country now. Almost everybody's left except Chucho Valdez, because he has, he's such a high, important figure in the Cuban cultural phenomenon. He can go anywhere he wants. And now Obama has recognized Cuba, so basically. <laughs> Cuban musicians can come here, we can go to Cuba, not surreptitiously through the Bahamas, kind of going but, uh, legally. Uh, so that's a big step in intercultural relationships. Is it true that a lot of those uh, Cuban pianists, I always heard it was such a powerful technique that they were, they, they were studying a lot with the uh, Russian uh, classical Well, he was before Russian. They were really highly classically trained. Right, right. But their training had to come through Russia because that was the only connection they had. They well, from the Soviet period on. Yeah, right. Uh, Soviet, uh, Soviet 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 but before that, the Russian, the uh, classical, classical studies were really uh, accentuated a lot. Mm -hmm. I was in Cuba in '96, and we had a very, very good piano player in my class, teacher in my class, Cuban guy. And one day he says, "I want to miss class tomorrow." He said, I want to send a good sub, believe me. So, so he showed up next day, Chucho Valdez was sitting there. Oh, he got a lot of sub. So the first thing he did was. He did a, a double octave chromatic scale from top to bottom. Then he started to teach. And at some point in the class, he said, Why don't you play the chromatic scale at the beginning? He said, Well, because in Cuba, ever since the Russians left, Pianos are all falling apart. They all have six or seven, sometimes 20 different broken bro bro notes. So when I do this, oh, there's no B flat. There's no B flat either. I memorize very quickly where the notes are missing. And then I rearrange the piece to avoid those notes. What a mind. But this is what they had to do. And they all have enormous chops, which is why. When you listen to a Cuban piano player take a solo, it's never. It's never that. It's, it's double octaves, because that's the only way you can be heard in the Latin rhythm section with bongos, congas, timbales, you know, all these different percussion instruments. Uh, plus, it's just the flavor of the music. Uh, there was the earliest known Cuban. Jazz piano player was a guy named Peruchin, who recorded in the 40s. He truly was a jazz musician. I mean, he played typical Cuban music also, but he was recording tunes like Over the Rainbow in 1947, things like that. And so, if you want to research Cuban jazz, uh, that's probably the first name I would type into your uh, search engine. P, just like it sounds. And it will lead you to some YouTube performances. Thank God for YouTube, I guess. Uh, but you hear some ancient Cuban jazz, which sounds really good today. I'm sorry, what's his name? Yes, Peruchin. P E R U C H I N. Just like it seems. Questions? Yes. Uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, how you might approach adding some sort of like ear training component? To our practice, to some of the things that you were discussing earlier? Ear training. What's your problem with ear training? No, how you, might, how you might uh, transcribe it? Uh, well, how you would go about adding some sort of component of that to our practice with some of the things that you were discussing? Well, ear training, 
I would say the first thing is learn to transcribe early in your career. If you haven't started yet, start not tomorrow, but tonight. What's your favorite record on transcribe the melody and the chord changes? Not a solo. Don't start with a chick or a solo. Ah, uh, Spain, I'm going to learn that solo. No. Uh, you'll give up pretty quickly. Uh, and then make sure you have the correct tools. Make sure you have a tape machine or a CD player right on the piano with you. Uh, make sure it has a pitch control so it puts it right in tune with your piano. If it's a quarter tone off, forget it. You'll be able to do it. And then start out with a form. Create a lead sheet. If it's 32 bars, four bars per line, eight, eight systems. Uh, if it's a first and second ending of one bar each, and you put five bars on the second system and five bars on the third system. Make sure, have a plot. Put the, put the first and second ending in, put the repeat signs in, so you don't have to stop what you're doing. And then start with the bass notes. Listen to the bass player. Turn the bass up, turn the treble way down. How many of you ever practice with Amos Hold Records? Okay, that's the most important thing. You can turn certain tracks up, you can turn the piano track up, you can turn it off, you can turn the bass track way up, you can turn it way down. So that's how I learned to practice. I used to play trombone. I used to play with those records eight hours a day. <coughs> Drug my neighbors nuts. <laughs> um, the next thing, if you want to take, if you want to get some ear training records, or CDs, there are some available. Uh, Armin Donelia, uh, New York musician, very good piano player, has put out several uh, ear training CDs. David Baker, a great educator from Indiana University, also has several CDs out, uh, ear training CDs. They're specifically designed for jazz musicians. Uh, I think transcri transcriptions is the first thing and learn tunes first before solos. Because first of all, you need to build up your repertoire. I mean, you transcribe an entire song, you're probably never gonna forget it. So you added one more tune to your, a thousand tunes that you have to know to be a jazz musician. Right. <laughs> Where are you from? Pardon? Where are you from originally? Originally, uh, that hotbed of jazz, Concord, New Hampshire. <laughs> Where is it? New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, didn't learn anything about jazz there. But my parents, my dad retired and moved to Florida when I was about 12, 13 years old. So uh, and that's, I lived in an obscure town called Daytona Beach, Florida. It's not that obscure. But I was lucky and a retired jazz pianist was living there. So I got my first lessons from him. So, but I think I really got my, my education hanging out at Berkeley when I was going to Boston University. Can you, uh, before we wrap things up, can you talk about your books? I know you have a new one out, and, I, and of course the Jazz 30 book is sure, one actually, of many, many I have uh, three years universities. Years to uh, the first one I wrote was the Jazz Piano book, which I always recommend, even if you right. want to study theory, because the theory in here is the same as it is in the theory, in the Jazz Theory book. Mm -hmm. Just I wrote this first, figuring you're never going to write another book, and then my publisher prevail upon me to write a second book, the Jazz Theory book. Uh, by the way, this is kind of a self-indulgent uh, title, The Jazz Piano Book. That's because we couldn't come up with a title. Pretty soon, like a month from publication, three weeks, two weeks, pick a title already. So, I don't know, seven letters, 13 numbers, 13 numbers, seven letters. So this became the default title. It's not a self-indulgent title. So naturally, I booked the follow-up book, The Jazz Theory Book. <laughs> and then I came up with this one music, how to voice standards at the piano. While you're playing. So that's great. And how in, in terms of making a live like you said, I mean, it's difficult to make a living just playing music, but do you do you make a, a, a good a fair amount of money from just your publications? Or do you do you self publish things or at all or you go through No, I have a, a really good publisher which many of you are familiar with Chuck Sharon. Chuck Sharon Music. Probably the biggest publisher of jazz books, next to Jamie or so. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the fake books that you buy, the new real book, anything that has new and real in the title is his publication. Mm -hmm. So he comes to you right the beginning. And I make far more money selling from the royalties from those books than I do playing, certainly nowadays. Because mm -hmm. I'm almost forgotten by most young musicians. Mm -hmm. uh, 
this is the jazz scene in San Francisco, in San Francisco area. By the way, you introduced me it's from Los Angeles. I used to live in Los Angeles, but I'm from the Bay Area now. Mm -hmm. uh, 46 years, something like that, 45 years. Um, there's almost no jazz scene. There's a, you know, I, if I work once or twice a month, it's a good work. So. There's a lot of younger guys that, have, that are working more than me that they're willing to work for $30 a night. That includes bridge toll. Thanks. <laughs> so I'm not willing to do that anymore. So. That's becoming an issue here now. Do you, you feel that that's uh, How do you feel about that? that, that, that well, do you feel like that this should be like a, a young musician's union? It's funny. Or? As uh, what was it said, jazz isn't dead. It just smells funny. Famous <laughs> <laughs> rock musician. Frank Zappa. For example, <laughs> jazz truly is dying. It will never die, but it's dying anyway. Uh, but jazz education is booming. So how do you square those? So this has been true for 30, 40 years. It's the same situation as you find in classical music. We're turning out probably 30, 40,000 new violinists a year in the conservatory system. Are there gigs for 30, 40,000 violinists? Heck no. To get a major symphony orchestra, you either have to wait for somebody to die or retire. Then you have to go through a fierce uh, audition process with 80 other violinists trying to get the same gig. So uh, it's just art music is art music never pays, except if you're one of the elite. However, uh, you can make at least a decent living before you have to support a family. Uh, and then when you have to support a family, then they yeah, change a little bit. You need to something that you really don't. You need to get a job teaching. To play another kind of music other than strictly jazz, um, so it's become it's become an issue here. It's become an issue all over. Well, yeah, I think so. Uh, but then I don't know. I you know there's there's, there's, there's certain places like a place like Snug Harbor uh, that uh, guarantees that side there. So I'm Mark Village Vanguard, and, and that they treat the musicians really well, and they always guarantee that you're going to make a certain amount of money, and they give you more money if you have a good turnout. But then there are clubs like across the street that will play for the door, and sometimes they don't make much money. But then I, I talk sometimes to my son; he makes more money. Right? <laughs> you know, so you, you never know. I mean, you know, this sometimes um, it can be a very successful thing just just uh, marketing your own music and playing for the door yeah. too. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not guaranteed, guaranteed anymore. You have to learn how to market your music, yeah. which is completely against the grain of how I was raised. <laughs> Reality. I have really no answer. Yeah. Just yeah. Anyway, how about a hand for Mark?